In studio with the Friday Five, which includes the first half hour holdovers, the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield. Good morning again, Rob. Great to be here. Mike oozing from his pores the fun of Thursday night heights. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> the senior member of our crew, Michael Carl. Good morning. He is an attorney at law as well, Lauren Schultz. Good morning. And via telephone, Joseph Joey Tuts for ready. Good morning, everyone. Good to have you with us, Joe. Ah, nice to hear it, Rob. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> if you could have been here, Joe, to see Heights storm in here at 100 miles an hour, like, like hung, hung over. <laughs> I was behind a school bus. <laughs> we have a lot of school bus in this county. <laughs> I think... Do you ever see one of those, uh, you're, you're driving along the road and you're going like, wow, that guy's following that dude too closely, and then you realize that they're towing a car behind? Yeah. I think Bodwell's car is attached to a school bus. In <laughs> school bus is in front of his car. When he bought it, I think it was a two-for-one deal, and yeah. he just is behind that school bus his entire yeah. day. He saves every day. gas. Yeah. Yeah, what is that, what's that called? Uh, drafting. Drafting. There yeah, you go. drafting. Thank you very much. So uh, for the intros today, we're kind of going back to the future a little bit with a couple of you. I have to admit, I didn't know the mood Height was in when I wrote this, so I'm not really sure exactly how, how his intro is going to be perceived. But I'm willing to roll the dice. Because with a guy's wearing a hat like that, how bad can he hurt you? All right? All right, but before we get to that, I think we're starting with Larry Schultz here today. And for that, we also go back to the future a little bit. We heard those rumors trolling, trolling down the track. Now Fonny is in trouble, and Trump is coming back. We're back in Fulton County to separate truth from lie. <laughs> the momentum is with the Donald, so Larry Schultz hangs his head and cries. <laughs> that, would, that would be more painful if you were a better singer. <laughs> You don't, you don't think that's a voice that can carry a tune? No. <laughs> that was great. I, I think i got to disagree, Larry. I think with that Johnny Cash music, I think that was pretty good. That was yeah, great. That is great. Right? You know, you got um, to, to do the... Joe's, Joe, let's listen to Joe because he's like, he's right. Trump is coming back. <laughs> and Joe's in pain right now, aren't you, Joe? The voice was great. It's the lyrics he didn't like. I think the lyrics were great, too. I, if, I I'm not going to so pat too. myself on the back as much as the rest of uh, you will, but still. I agree. Go a little something uh, like yeah. this. I had to switch out of uh, that music to my next one, which goes with the Badger here. The Badger is back, and what a guy. The delegate is in the house, and we know why. The 60-day session has ended, and seriously, just in time, before someone did something crazy, like passing a law, putting kids to work in a coal mine. <laughs> like I said, I wasn't sure that one was going to go over with the moody uh, came in. That was that was my bill. That was Mike's coma. <laughs> I'm Mr. Carl. The cards are back in camp and what makes hope spring eternal. It will help Mike Carl forget WVU basketball, which was more infernal. They say Bob Huggins wants back in and that would be pretty sick. And it has no chance of happening, according to Megadona Kenny Kendrick. You want the Huggins back or not? I'd love it. I knew you'd like him back. <clears throat> Joe, yours combines new with old, and it's a classic. All right? We spoke once before about a young Joey Torts, watching history from his couch, eating Cheetos, and watching and wearing shorts. Well, as history would have it, was this date in 1991, when the Federal Republic of Germany united to become one. And this all began November 10, 1989, if I recall, when those East and West Germans began to tear down the wall. Chunks of rock were chipped as the world watched in awe, but one man in particular was watching a young attorney at law who began typing out letters as the collapsing wall buried people alive. They read, Frau, if you've been injured by falling rock, call 304-264-8505. Well done, well done. That one, that one combined a little, little old with a little new. I love it. And now you, Billy, a lot of people don't know when Bill was county commissioner, it was a rocky time. He was president of the commission, didn't always have the support of everybody. You Not know, a lot of money. Power struggle, yeah. right? Et tu brute sprang from this day when you literally get stabbed in the back. That's the first thing you say. Yesterday is the Ides of March, and it comes from 44 B.C. when Julius Caesar met his doom and went down in history. It's not easy being the king, and Bill Stubblefield knows this well. 
He won't complain publicly. He'd never kiss and tell. But when he was commissioned president, he survived a coup d'etat. His response was so overwhelming. That's why his time is remembered as the reign of shock and awe. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm going to come push back a little bit on that. I'm uh, not going to let you. Well, That's time to go to jail for a <laughs> we, we had disagreements uh, when I was a county commission. All county commissions do. But there was never any backstabbing. There's never any running around trying to uh, destroy somebody. I, we treated each other as friends and treated each other very professionally. There was only three at that time, right? No, we had five. You had five? Yeah. Okay. So we started off with three, then moved it to five. Gotcha. Yeah. Bill, first line of comedy. I know, I know. I know. Don't ruin a good joke with facts. <laughs> the facts don't matter. <laughs> well, it's in light of what we're seeing in Jefferson County now. And uh, But, yeah, we, we had a problems, but we, ne- we did not do any backstabbing. Let's move on to uh, issue number one, our leadoff hitter. And for that, we go to Joseph Joey Toots for ready. You know, Rob, uh, in my advancing years, every so often I catch myself thinking about what I'm doing with my life. And after listening to the introduction you did for Larry Schultz, this is one of those times. Um, The first topic, Rob, that we, uh, I think, uh, want to address uh, in the aftermath of the legislative session just wrapping up in Charleston, uh, there were a lot of bills that we spent time discussing on air and sometimes even privately. And a lot of those bills never made it to the finish line. So it got me thinking in reviewing what our legislature accomplished this past uh, year, were there some bills that we would have liked to have seen passed that didn't, or perhaps maybe a bill passed that we are uh, wishing hadn't? Uh, so uh, thinking about what we had talked about and, and what was covered extensively, uh, what did not pass was child care funding, child tax credits, DHHR funding, the travel ball bill, the baby Olivia video, in God we trust being uh, uh, prominently displayed in the schools, firearms for teachers, the Crown Act, which uh, prohibited discrimination based upon hairstyles, Obscenity charges that librarians and museum curators might be subject to if they display obscene material. The Women's Bill of Rights. These are just some of the uh, legislative policy proposals that just never made it to the finish line. Uh, So I ask this morning, what would we have should have hoped passed and what do we think passed maybe that we don't like and maybe should have been left on the cutting room floor. I uh, was concerned that we didn't get this student discipline bill passed that Amy Grady was proposing that got out of the Senate and apparently died in the House. Uh, I, I thought that some clarification for teachers as to how to deal with unruly students who are prohibiting other students from learning in a classroom setting. I thought that that might have been a worthwhile endeavor for the legislature to tackle, but uh, sadly that didn't go anywhere. So I'm interested in what the other panelists have to think, uh, or what they think and what they have to say, except for Mike Hyde, who I cannot take seriously with that stupid hat on his head. (laughs) That's just a mean attack. (laughs) That's a terribly mean attack. You're you're an (laughs) anti-hatter. I will not tolerate anti hatness He's, he's anti St. Patrick. What is that? <laughs> Mr. Stubblefield, you lead off with the answers here, sir. Uh, yeah, Joe, the one that comes to mind that I wish had passed was the uh, school resource officer, the uh, SROs. Uh, $24, $25 million, I think it was uh, priced out at, and that was the reason given that it did not go forward. I think this is a small amount to pay for the safety of our school children. Uh, as John Doyle would say, uh, that a friend the teacher uh, is uh, has its own risk. That John would argue that you cannot get enough training to have someone effective uh, to protect our children. SROs could do that. Uh, SROs in every school, in my view, would be the first avenue of hardening our schools to the point that reduce the risk of uh, of what we've seen in other states. So that's my one wish that had that wish i had passed michael carl well and i wasn't 
that aware of that bill and you know what what was behind it, but I, I pretty much agree with what Bill said. The the, the big thing that that I was disappointed didn't happen was was a further refinement of the overall state tax reform. And and you know there were little picks here and there and different things and you know social security personal property tax. It, but I believe Rob's right. If the, with the rebate that essentially in a backdoor way eliminates that. Now, I don't like the way it does it. I would be in favor of um, running that again as a referendum um, and changing the constitution. Well, yeah, and that, that's really what I'm calling Because for. we're we're just causing uh, right, uh, right. work to, to give a rebate. That seems yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, we, we need a, a better way to achieve that relief. That has to right. be done by referendum, though, does it not? Well, yeah. yeah. And it got, it got voted down. And, 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 yeah. and it got voted down almost purely, well, you know, because of the effort of, of our governor, you know, politically. But they, if they had put in there that there shall be, uh, you know, reimbursement from the state to the counties for the loss, the change, you know, the, the reduction of the revenue, mm-hmm. they would have passed. It would have had to pass. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, I would go back to the lack of um, any real effort to move things forward with child welfare, uh, public education, and uh, specifically higher public ed. Um, There are real problems uh, at WVU. I've spoken to a couple of people in a couple of the professional schools that have seen their faculty with the same number of students they had last year drop by a third with people resigning and the, the cuts to some faculty things and then other people on the faculty looking at it and saying, oh, I'm going to be next, so goodbye. I'm going to look for another job and just leave. And, uh, you know, I think at w, at WVU Law School, the numbers went from 29 faculty members to currently 18 for the same number of students. You are not going to get the same quality of education. And WVU Law School uh, was, um, you know, it's in the middle range of law schools in the United States of America. It's not going to stay there if we don't uh, reform this and find a way. Michael Height. Well, a couple different issues. Um, Since higher education is is the last thing that was talked about, I'll say to me that is right-sizing higher education it has been bloated and overfunded for a while now and it is and then a lot of times it's been their effort with with internally to right size their own universities it hasn't been the legislature trying to force that on them on the other issues there were a lot of when we talk a lot about a lot of bills that were going to cost money the child care and 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 idd waiver and all these different things that were going to cost the state money when that that threat of a clawback came in late in the legislature it was like we we put a stop on anything that was going to cost money um that hadn't already been passed so if it had already been passed there was it was you couldn't go back and unpass it at that point but if it hadn't been passed at that point it was sort of like it's off the table now we have to figure out this clawback, this $165 million uh, in clawback spending before we can go forward with any of these other things. And then there became this push to to uh, find money, this $165 million, and push it towards educational type things. Now we talk about SROs. I would have thought some of that money could have been pushed towards the SROs and gotten that bill passed. but. There were stipulations on how money had to be spent, and I don't know if that fit in that category or not. I, I don't know the answer to that, and and that could be possibly why that didn't that didn't pass. My thinking, though, my thinking though, Mike, is that the SRO had already been put to bed before this clawback surfaced, at least uh, here in the Eastern Panel before it surfaced. Uh, <coughs> and John Hardy, uh, text in a second ago, said uh, the uh, SRO one hundred fourteen dollars per student. Uh, his argument is, and my argument is, that's a fairly inexpensive amount to pay for, say, insurance. Now, it could have been associated with a clawback, but I don't believe so. I think the SRO had already been 
decided not to go forward before the clawback came. It's, it's hard to tell which ones were yeah. and which ones yeah. weren't because everything was off the table at, at a certain point yeah. that was going to cost money. Now, some of these other things that we had we had brought up and talked about, um, uh, whether it's the uh, Teachers' Bill of Rights or, or women's rights or whatever, a lot of those things were on the list at the very last day, and, and they were on the list to pass, and, be, and they just we just didn't get to them. Uh, there was anywhere from 20 to 40 different bills that we were looking at towards the end. And when when people stand up and start talking about bills and, and eating up 20, 30 minutes at a time, you just run out of time, even though I think a lot of those bills would have passed if it would have just been a simple vote or if we had had another day. Um, and, and I think some of that is because I believe we started extremely slow this year in the session. We just we didn't move forward very quick at all. So I don't know why we couldn't have gotten a lot of this stuff done on the front end. Um, and it just seemed to take too long to get going. What happened to the school discipline bill, Mike? Uh, again, I, th I think that one would have passed if we had had more just time. Yeah. Back to you, Joe. Yeah, Mike, I, that's an interesting comment you made about the beginning of the session because I – just from reading news accounts of what was going on in Charleston, that was my sense of things was that there wasn't a whole lot of substantive work being done at the very beginning. And I, I can't uh, – maybe you can put your finger on why, but it just seems like it was a mad rush at the end. The budget was, was rushed through, and uh, a lot of important bills and a lot of important goals of the legislature were unmet because of this last-minute rush. So what was going on at the beginning of the session that uh, work wasn't getting done? Yeah, I don't know. Um, everybody I talked to is the same way. That, you know, we just don't seem to be moving very fast. And and I, I think some people thought, you know, we have plenty of time. We're, we're okay. And, and then I think that clawback really threw a wrench into everything. Um, I think we had the, the budget figured out, and then, you know, all of a sudden this clawback hits, and, oh, crap the budget we don't have the budget figured out um and then there were some uh you know supplemental appropriations we had to do to figure out the budget there was there was a lot of uh, a lot of moving parts towards the end um that affected the budget is the reason it came out as late as it did i think it would have came out a whole lot earlier if it had not been for this huge sum of money that we had to account for now there's some talk well, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Bill. I was going to say uh, there's some talk about uh, coming back into a uh, uh, meeting again in May. But on Metro News, uh, the governor has hinted that he's going to bring you back into session sometime in the next few weeks just to address some of these health issues. Yeah, I, I saw that as well. I saw an article where he talked about maybe even as, as early as April um, bringing us back for a special session that they need to be taken care of a whole lot sooner than in um, May just to make sure we get it right for July 1. So um, what what I do know, April, May, r regardless, we're going back into special session to try to take care of some of these issues. They originally said May, I think, because that gave them a 10-month window of revenues and how much surpluses we should have to have. And it gave them an indication of, of what we'll have and how we can put that in the budget. You're assuming, I, I think, Mike, that there's going to be some uh, agreement between the state and the federal government about the clawback. And oh, I, I think there year, already is. Yeah, year. there okay. th there already is. Um, it, you know, in talking to different people and um, people at the governor's office, their their attitude was, number one, West Virginia is not writing a check back to the federal government. That's just not going to happen. So then it became a negotiation of, of how we're going to do this. And the federal government didn't want the money back. In, in their defense, they didn't want it back. They just said, you didn't spend it the way you wanted us to spend it. We're not saying it's your fault. There's 40-some other states that have, are in the same boat. Um, we just want it spent. So the governor worked with them back and forth. The governor's office worked with them back and forth to say, all right, let's figure a way to, to, to do this. And, and that's sort of where they are right now. So I don't think that we were ever in jeopardy of having to pay it back, that we would rather put it into the schools now than give it back to the, the federal government, obviously. Um, so... Like I say, I don't think that was ever a problem. Well, if you gave that money back, you could cut the federal uh, 
deficit, the national debt from thirty four trillion six hundred billion to thirty four trillion five hundred ninety nine and a half billion. What about that? Good yeah. math, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> is the 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 agreement with the feds uh, would pay raises for the teachers become part of that equation? Yes. Yes, and I think they even took um, uh, last year's pay raises as well to to try to help make up that 465 million. So it was last year's, this year's, and plus a whole plethora of other things. Um, uh, somebody talked in here the other day about uh, the school building authority and, and giving 150 million dollars to the school building authority. That was part of it too. What we did is we just anything that was on the the books for the school building. Job getting us started. Thank you kindly. As we welcome back our Friday crew, including. Joe Ferretti via, uh, via telephone. Uh, Mr. Lawrence Schultz from the law firm of Berkshire's Harmon Jenkinson. Good morning, Larry. Good morning to you. Delegate Michael Height. Good morning, sir. A senior member of our crew. Mr. Michael Carl, attorney at law. Good morning, everybody. And leading us off with issue number two, Mr. William Stubblefield. You know, Joe, I thought your plug in the law firm was, was pretty good, but not nearly as effective as Rob's introduction plug in your law firm <laughs> it's a double right. it's a double plus <laughs> yeah yeah uh the session uh mike asked a question uh some of the strength i guess joe asked a question some of the good bills some of the bad bills that was passed one bill that was passed was uh the public uh public broadcasting uh they changed the name uh of the governing body they also uh changed the uh the reporting that gave more power to a cabinet um, elevating the cabinet member elevating individuals to a cabinet status that would have direct control over public uh tele uh, public broadcasting public broadcasting was formed back in the late 60s early 70s as a vehicle of providing a uh a non-commercial objective uh fairly detailed review of uh, of news and i think by and large it's been nonpartisan of course that's dependent upon your vantage point whether it is or is not but i think they they've attempted to be fairly nonpartisan and argument has been given uh that this uh that the government should have more control because it's uh, state funds coming in that's true about 35 percent of the budget is from the state uh, about 18 percent of the budget from the federal just slightly under 50 percent though are private funded and or or grants uh my question uh to my distinguished colleagues is are we moving in a direction that there's less independence uh for public broadcasting and more and a greater opportunity for a government to use public broadcasting as a mouthpiece for their interests and their concerns. Well, let's start first with Larry Schultz. Mr. Schultz? Yeah, I think that's a very big danger. Um, these are supposed to be uh, media corporations that examine facts in a nonpartisan way, put together an argument, plus or minus or in between, and put it out there so that the listener can count on, hey, this isn't whatever the advertiser's name is, uh, as you have on regular TV, them paying to get their viewpoint aired. And, yeah, that when the government begins to control the media uh, in a way uh, similar to what you're talking about, we don't have, uh, I would just assume they, they turn it off, frankly. Uh, we don't need to spend more tax dollars to give us the government's idea of what's best for us. I, don't, I just don't think that's a good idea. Let's go right to the counter with Michael Height. So I would agree with you, and my opinion is that they should turn it off because <laughs> it, it is partisan. And, and I think that's the issue, that if it's going to be taxpayer-funded and it is as partisan as it is right now, and maybe that's not how it was originally organized, and maybe it's not supposed to be partisan, but it is. And, and that's unfortunate. And if it's going to have a left slant to it all the time, then it's time to defund it totally and, and get it out of there. And, and we'll just have, you know, places like WRNR, they'll give you the news. And it can be slanted left, it can be slanted right, but that's up to the individual owner. But taxpayer-funded um, radio should not be slanted one way or the other. And I, I think that was the problem, that this one was. 
Now, putting it under the governor's office, you know, I, I don't agree with that either. I, I don't like that move. I would rather just defund it all, the, all together and gotten rid of public radio. How much money do they get, Mike? Do you know? No, I don't know what the exact number yeah. is. Yeah, uh, from the state, three three point nine million. It's a small amount, basically. Yeah. 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 All right, Mr. Ferretti. Well, Mike, I'm sorry you feel that way because for years I would tune into West Virginia Public Broadcasting to learn about legislation that was being proposed, debated, and and ultimately either passed or rejected by the legislature. I I never looked at it as having a slant. Maybe maybe that's my own bias showing through because I didn't see a bias in the presentation on television. But it was a source of information for me and perhaps many other West Virginians. And and what's happened recently, I think, is is a shame. Uh, And perhaps it's been ruined to the point where we need to defund it because what the governor has done by uh, ousting the, the, the executive director and putting in place people like Greg Thomas, who, you know, is a, is a Republican operative in this state uh, for, for years. He's on the board now, as is uh, uh, Senator Stephen Baldwin, who's also, uh, you know, obviously going to have one point of view in, in this uh, in this matter. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's to the point now where we can question the the, the information that's being provided and whether it's slanted one way or the other, but it's a shame. It it, it, it was supported by uh, people who, you know, bought the stuff they were hawking on television to raise funds. Uh, it was publicly supported, and and I think it was a worthwhile uh, venture for decades in this state. But uh, as with anything else, it's become politicized now, and I think uh, the politicization it has continued under this current governor. And, and I, I just find that a shame. Mr. Carl. Well, I, I, I kind of agree with everything that's said, even though it's not exactly the same. It, that all reveals what an in, inherent basic contradiction in concept it is. And it will always be a problem uh, about bias. I mean, anyway, you, it's just inherent because I, I so, mo- so much believe in in the free market system to manage the allocation of resources and and the 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 potential threat of publicly funded opinion you know or information being slanted is 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 always going to be a challenge and you know and i th- i think the public broadcasting system has you know, has done some decent work, but it's but it but there's nothing built into it that makes it objective. I, I have a before we go back to you, Bill, for, to wrap it up. I got a kind of a broader thought for the panel here on biased news stories. Now we we all know opinion is biased, and and columns are biased because that's what a columnist does. They write their opinion, and and that's what a show like this will do on a Friday, where you give your opinion on something. So the opinion is many times based on what your beliefs are, what your political slant is. But what makes a news story biased? If you're you're reporting straight news, uh, let's say you're reporting uh, any of the numerous uh, charges or indictments against President Trump, what makes that story inherently biased, Mike? If you don't think there's a difference... I'm not asking you what I think I think. I'm asking how you perceive a biased story. The tenor of the news that Mm -hmm. we get... From the Wall Street Journal versus the New York Times shows you the potential for bias in news reporting. But but what is it that makes it inherently biased? You, you mentioned public radio is inherently biased. What makes it inherently biased? Well, the, the, be, because the pub, uh, opinion is part of what you select to emphasize in reporting the news, and and, and there's no end to the issues that 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 are. You know, the, the people present as as facts when they leave out the facts that are contradictory to the conclusion that the facts they present lead you to. So, and you, and you can look you can look at the the Georgia trial right now, and you can mm-hmm. look at if if you're watching Fox News and and they're reporting it, their bias is they're focusing everything on Fannie Willis and the affair she had and and how 
how uh, unfortunate this was and how there was bias against Trump because of this, yada, 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 yada. But if you look at one of the other um, MSNBC or something like that, they're still focusing on all the charges. These are the charges. Okay, this is gone. Maybe they're out, but this person's going to come in, and these are the charges, and we still need to effectively prosecute on these particular charges. So same story, same same scenario, but two different ways to report right, it. Right, but if you're watching MSNBC or Fox, you are already inherently expecting a biased story to fit your point of view. Let's Correct. talk about regular network news, CBS, NBC, ABC, that sort of thing. What makes a story that they do biased in your perception? <laughs> Now, don't get all upset about it. I'm to, asking, to, you, I'm asking to, you to tell to, me how you perceive it to as biased. To suggest that CBS is... I'm not suggesting they're not biased, Mike. You're missing the point and of my I question. I thought that's exactly what you just said. No, I'm not questioning whether or not they're biased. I'm asking you how they do a story that makes you feel as though the story is biased. Because I, I have a, uh, a different view of the world, uh, and, and when I hear what they say and what they emphasize, you know, it reaffirms my conclusion that they're biased. Larry? I think we need to divide this a little bit. In the one hand, on the one hand, we're talking about a government of a state um, substantially funding a particular news source and putting people, uh, political people, frankly, uh, on their board to steer the message. Uh, you know, what you get from Fox Television was what Rupert Murdoch thinks. <laughs> And what you get from MSNBC is what whoever runs that network thinks. But it's not a direct subsidy from the government, okay? To me, that's completely different. But how do you know that's um, not already happening, Larry? How do you know whoever's in charge of that board right now, how do you know their slant isn't left? You know, it, it, and it says a lot when when yourself and Joe say, I don't see the slant in, in public broadcasting right now. And and people on the other side, like myself well, and, and Carl, say, we do see the slant. So if you don't see the slant, it seems like it's slanted to your, your direction. Well, but the government is not. Who's financing this slant to go in the direction? There's also a possibility that they're just analyzing the facts, and that's how it comes out. Yeah, the facts to your degree. Well, okay, but... You, there's a difference when you start saying, okay, we're going to put the government in charge of this media outlet. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely not going to work. First of all, you'll see them slant one way when there's one party in power and slant the other way when there's another party in power. I, and now it's just a big ad campaign 100 paid for by the taxpayers. Joe, how, when you were hearing a story, what makes you feel a story is biased? Well, it, it depends on, on the the factual content of the story, okay? I, I think what Mike and Mike are, are driving at is that some media outlets will, will emphasize a story, a, a factual story, if it is favorable for their point of view. So if you want to hear on uh, MSNBC that Biden's uh, economy is doing great, and factually we have the best unemployment numbers in a generation, that's a fact, you can go to MSNBC and you'll hear that. Now, if you want to go to Fox and hear that the Biden policy on the border is the biggest disaster this country has had in a generation, you can hear that. And that may be a fact, too, given how many people are crossing and not being processed appropriately. So it's, it's, it's not so much that the uh, information itself is being corrupted and presented in a biased way. It's just what they emphasize as news. And I, and I, and I can see their point in that. But with, with public broadcasting in West Virginia, um, as, I'm trying to be as objective as I can. I have not seen that bias come through. And if there's a concern today that what is being broadcasted over the air by West Virginia Public Broadcasting is biased, well, who's to blame? Because it's the Republicans sitting on that very board right now who are deciding what they what they broadcast. So I, I don't understand the problem there. But my concern is that when you start putting the uh, appointment powers now under the governor's office, you know, who's going to be on this board? Well, now you're introducing a political slant because <laughs> – 
<laughs> the governor is, is a political animal, and, and, and uh, that, that's, that's unavoidable. But I, I you know, so I, I'm concerned that, yeah, we, we're going to have an issue with this public broadcasting. But up until this point in time, as Mike said, I didn't see it beforehand. Maybe I was blinded by my own bias. I don't know. But if they're presenting facts, Okay, here's a bill that's on the floor today. It's being debated, and we're going to have a couple of legislators come on and discuss it. Well, I think that's meaningful and important for West Virginia residents. Bill, comes back to you. Yeah, I think we make the mistake of uh, talking about mainstream media and public uh, broadcast in the same sentence. They are have two different audiences. Uh, it also, uh, I think, is a representation of our microcosm today. It's awful difficult not to look at something in partisan eyes. Uh, if, if an argument is not made supporting your argument, your side, by definition, they're biased against you. And and that, I think, is not limited to this discussion. It's limited to most everything we do today. Uh, what I enjoy, appreciate about public broadcasting is they invariably try to put both sides, a representative of both sides, to address a an issue. Uh, that is missing in our commercial tele, uh, commercial broadcasting, uh, regardless of which side of the aisle. I think public broadcasting serves a very important ingredient to our uh, news uh, news gathering, news uh, similar uh, today. Uh, I would hate to view, uh, hate to think it does become so biased, we have to defund it. If we defund it, then we've lost an important element of our news. So uh, it's, uh, I find this disturbing. Uh, I find that I agree with Mike Hite to some degree. If it becomes, if it is dem- demonstrably biased, then it should be defunded. I'm not convinced it's demonstrably biased. The, the, the biased part of anything fascinates me because I studied journalism and communications in college. I took journalism law classes. I was, the campus radio station was a national public radio affiliate. I was trained by professional news directors, not student news directors, although the, the student news director who worked uh, in the position there to fill the student position below the professional news director uh, went on to a, a wonderful news career himself. The fact of the matter is, at no point along the way was I ever told what story should go into a newscast and what story should not. I was never, ever steered in a biased direction one way or the other. I was trained that you don't report anything until you get two confirmations of that story. You don't just throw a fact on the air, and you never throw speculation on the air. Now, granted, this was 40 years ago. I, I, I think the standards have changed tremendously since then with all reporting because of the pressures of getting an audience. But from my history and what, what I remember, I can tell you that I'm sure people thought our newscasts were biased at the time because that's human nature. But no, nowhere along the way did anybody ever tell me what stories should go into a newscast and what stories shouldn't, nor what slant I should take when creating a newscast. You were about to say, Larry. Um, just to take this back, though, we're talking about two different things. Yes, I know. You're talking about government and control. You, government control of, of the news is... That's, you know, uh, Nazi Germany time. That's uh, Russian, Russian Federation time. Vladimir Putin. Um, where when the government controls the media source, if you oppose the government, you are awful lonely. But, I mean, just to give you an example, if the Justice Administration controlled uh, to that extent um, the West Virginia public broadcasting, I bet they'd never run a story on the fact of uh, the tremendously poor way we handle child welfare in this state. They'd never run a story on the fact that West Virginia schools are 50th in the nation. That They're not going to run that story because they don't want to get their money cut off. Uh, and so, yeah, now you're talking about, in, in other words, to me, you can think they present packages of facts on private television networks uh, that are slanted one way or another. But if you let the government take over uh, and appoint the board members of a public broadcasting thing, that won't even be the problem. They'll pretend those other facts don't even exist or they're total lies uh, if they're ever brought up, which they won't be because one side controls the media source. And that's that's a scary thing to me. We go to issue number three, and for that, Michael Heights. 
All right, I'm going to go to an issue um, about the, the the legislature, the state legislature again, and and I've heard watching the show over the past couple of months, I get to see a little bit of it here and there, and and Bill brings up a, a, a quite frequently how the legislature focuses on cultural issues too much. Um, so I went back through the bills that that passed um, in the legislature, just the ones that passed, and. There were 279 bills that passed. Only 20 would be considered cultural or controversial. So why the different perception of it being so cultural? All right, I'm going to go right back to you, Bill. Yeah, uh, I think in large part, Mike, is what uh, those bills that receive a lot of press uh, and a lot of visibility. I did not go through the 279, but I suspect you're exactly right. Uh, but they, the, a lot of the bills that pass do not get the publicity, such as the Baby Olivia bill, mm -hmm. the transgender bill, uh, the uh, 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 the the library bill. Uh, all, a lot of those. Those are the ones that, and none of those, by the way, passed. Correct. Uh, but they're the ones that got a lot of visibility, a lot of press. I think if you did a, a different type of scrub and looking at all the bills introduced, you'd find a larger percent of bills that would be considered cultural than the 8% that are the ones that did pass. Larry? Um, I have something I, I think probably very similar, a view of this very similar to Bill's. We talked a great deal about some of these cultural bills that came up, and I can't help but think the legislator, legislature spent a great deal of valuable time fighting those bills into the oblivion they deserved. Um, the problem is, we were just talking a little while ago, it's a 60-day session or a little bit more, and you run out of time. At the end, there's a whole bunch of bills you'd like to pass you can't get to. Those two things are not unrelated. They are directly related. And the more time we waste talking about baby Olivia, the less time we have available to fix real problems. And so... Yeah, it's it wouldn't have to be 50-50 for it still to be agonizing for those of us out there to listen when they say, okay, well, you know, teachers with guns but no vaccines. <laughs> I mean, when, when that stuff is there, it starts to make the folks sitting back at home worry, have these people lost their minds? Uh, and so that also uh, de deletes and detracts from the... Uh, the attention uh, that every citizen ought to be paying to what's going on in the legislature. So it wouldn't have to be 50-50. Uh, 10 to 90 is pretty tough to take, frankly. <laughs> 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 Technically 89 to 11. <clears throat> uh, let's see. By the way, um, our <clears throat> very witty audience, and the, the governor's not sure if he's going to sign that vaccine bill or not. I don't know if you've uh, read that article, but our very witty audience has dubbed that bill the Make Measles Great Again uh, bill. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I salute that name for it uh, myself. I think that's just a wonderful way to, to refer to that. So uh, anyway, Mike Carl. Well, uh, there, 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 there is a, 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 an issue of of of. Uh, potential bias and and you, you need you need to to uh, and, and I monitor uh, bills for the Eastern Panel Business Association they're mostly dealt with economic policy you know so so these cultural things don't necessarily you know show up in in that focus but there's some things that are so uh, 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 you know, affect uh, uh, have impactful, I should say, on on the quality of public education. That some of the bills that that had to do uh, uh, with with uh, you know what what the, the the bias of of the teachers union and and uh, you know uh, uh, may, you know may. Uh, Making it clear that uh, I won't say in God we trust has to be shown everywhere, but to make sure that that the teachers union bias doesn't creep into our public education system, and that 
can have an impact on on uh, uh, you know, the economy of the state. And and so, uh, but I, I agree with most of what's been said that that we had way too much focus this session on on some of these cultural cultural bills. Yeah, well, Mr. Ferretti. Well, I, I I say this never having sat in a a uh, committee meeting or having served in the legislature. So bear with me. But I have to believe that the uh, fact that some of these cultural bills were introduced and debated and, and sucked all the oxygen out of the room, especially early on in the legislative session, uh, was a major distraction to the legislature and, and did not allow them to tackle some of the more important issues of the day, such as child care centers that are badly in need of funding and the child tax credit, because even the chamber is telling these folks, hey, we don't we can't hire people because they don't have child care. Uh, that's how you're going to get more West Virginians to work is give families the ability to have child care so that uh, both parents in that household can get to work. They're willing and able to do it but they don't have the ability. So I, 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 so I do fault perhaps the, uh, the leadership in the House and Senate from not controlling things and, and you know, not triple referencing these bills so they don't see the light of day and they don't suck all the oxygen out of the room. And I also fault the media, which frankly uh, is asleep when, you know, we're debating this baby Olivia video, and in the meantime, the legislature is granting $50 million of tax relief to coal companies. That, that's real money that the state is, is sending. This, and, and it may be good policy. I don't know, but it should be debated. And I want to know why $50 million is going to them and not to child, child care. And it, it, also, the legislature gutted this whole process of the legislative auditor's office, which independently audits state agencies for efficiency and effectiveness. Now that's under the thumb of both the House, the Speaker of the House, and the Senate President, who are going to decide who gets audited and when and whether those audits ever are made public. That's not good governance, but that's what the legislature accomplished. So I, I, I fault the media for not focusing on some of the more important things that West Virginians should have in mind when they're rating the performance of their legislature. Coming back to you, Michael. So I think I, I think a lot of this is it, it, it's what Bill said that they, they focus the media focuses on the cultural issues. Um, believe it or not, the legislature can walk and chew gum at the same time. So, it, to to in, to inference that that we got hung up on debating cultural issues and that's why we didn't have time to do anything else. That's just not true. We we can debate those issues and still have time to do all these other things um, if we just manage our clock a little bit better. And I think that's what happened here is we didn't manage our clock very well. The the debate about, I, I can tell you why baby Olivia uh, failed, and it was because it didn't have the support of the Republican side. And it didn't have the report or it didn't have the support of the Republican side because it was a singular um, uh, business that was giving the the video and nobody wanted to put in code that a singular uh, company um, can can put forth a, a video if if there's many uh, businesses that have similar videos about about the the stages of, of the the embryo and, and the fetus then we can pick from any one of them it may have made it through but because this focused on one that's why it didn't make th make it through now there were some of the other ones that that um, I fully expect to see next year and we just ran out of time and that's why they didn't didn't get taken taken up um, so we are still have cultural issues next year um, there's no doubt in my mind there will be. But believe me, there were a ton of other bills that just don't get media coverage that we got through. Um, and, you know, Joe, you, you bring up the, the $50 million. They, I'm, I'm pretty sure those were the tax credits for road funding. So I see what you're saying in that regard. Um, 
I think my impression of that particular bill was those tax credits were for the coal companies to come back in and fix the roads that they had been damaging. So it would be either the, the coal companies fixing those roads or the state having to put up the $50 million and fix those roads. Either way, uh, it just seemed like it was a whole lot easier to have the coal companies fix them and we'll give you $50 million in credits to fix them rather than us having to find somebody to come in and do it ourselves. And on that note, oh, that's the wrong one. We'll go to the, we'll come back to that later. I, David uh, Valente posted something I'm going to reach you in a moment, too. So uh, on our uh, comment section, in our comment section, I should say that David Valente uh, has posted that Judge Rules Willis can stay on the Trump case. So we circle back with the Folsom well, prison information. How about that? It's real interesting. The, yeah, you're about to say the, that? The, the issue was never anything except... Does she, under Georgia law, does she have an actual conflict of interest? In other words, is she on the side of the defendant? Has she done something to to uh, demonstrate that she's on the side of the defendant? If she hasn't, then this was just all smoke and mirrors once again. Um, also, in, in regards to our uh, bias conversation, William Whittington posted, Fox and Newsmax equals facts. All others operate on what their donors or lobbyists direct. <laughs> yeah, I can't even go there. You, you guys wow. are, you, but that, and, and I don't blame him for posting that. But I, I think that's what most people feel like: the news yep. that they watch is the one that gives yeah. them facts. Yep. Everybody else's news is not facts; it's bias. I think that's very much the prevalent view. Larry, okay. it's issue number four, time, and that's your time. Okay, you can do with it what you wish. Yeah. Um, this is a fairly easy one, I'm sure. How can it be that the man disparaged by many on the right as a Green New Dealer has overseen the supremacy of the United States oil industry worldwide? We now produce more oil per day than any other country. Um, it's been an awful long time, if ever, since that has been true. How did we suddenly get the, the hottest oil industry in the on the planet there is it your opinion that we produce more oil than anyone else no, in the world or is this a fact it's a fact that is a fact <laughs> number two is russia number three is saudi or i may have that they're right neck and neck he just is, below us that is a fact well we choose to not believe your facts <laughs> <laughs> biden shut down all the oil production all of it <laughs> right now we're running our cars on extra virgin sicilian olive oil <laughs> All right, so there's your, there's your question there. This, this is obviously tongue-in-cheek. Uh, yeah. Mr. Ferretti, you go first. Well, By the way, Joe, did you get a text from Mike Hornby during the commercial break? Uh, you know, I, if I did, I'm ignoring it. Because <laughs> <laughs> he opened the door and called us all idiots and said you were totally wrong on your audit, uh, audit point, by the way. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll discuss it with him uh, off air. Uh, I... Larry, of course, what you do point out is factual and, and somewhat ironic, but the other irony in, in this, and, and I think part of the oil production boom that's taken place in, in this country is the permitting that the Biden administration has uh, allowed. And that, interestingly enough, may be a political problem for the president going forward because the, the green lobby, which uh, – uh, by and large, our, our Democrats are, are not going to be happy with some of the permitting that's taken place. And you just wonder if it has softened some of his support in that uh, in environmental community uh, going forward as, as uh, he faces a, a re-election challenge in November. Uh, so that, that's the irony in all of this. Is it, it Really, it's irony all the way around. Number one, that, that uh, uh, a president uh, on uh, his side of the political spectrum has overseen this this boom in oil production, but also how it may have damaged him politically uh, for November. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if uh, some of those environmentalists who were in his camp in 2020 will remain there in 2024. Mr. Height. So I'm going to give uh, Larry the the uh, nod. His fact is correct, but. The United States became the leading oil producer in the world in 2018, not under this administration, under the last administration. And they have been the leader ever since in the production of oil. 
What we don't talk about when we talk about oil production is its uses and what oil is good for what. And not all oil is the same. Some oil can be used to, be, to make gasoline and some can't. And the problem we have with a lot of the oil that we get in the United States is it can't all be used to make gasoline. Um, the, 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 the oil we get down in Texas is great. It, it, it uh, converts to, to gasoline very well. Um, but some of the other areas that we get oil from doesn't. Um, and that's why we continue to import oil is because we need those types of oil to to uh, refine into gasoline um, and that's why we're exporting so much oil as well because it, it could be used for uh, petro petroleum based products uh, more so than than refining into gasoline so there is a difference in in what oil is used for and what we're actually producing here um, and what I think most of us would like to see is for us to start producing more oil that can be refined into gasoline to see the gasoline prices go down um, and continue with the production of oil um, in the petroleum based products as well and exporting that. Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, picking up on what Mike Height said, a lot of it is the high sulfur content which we have in the oil sands out west. Uh, this is not good for gasoline, it has other products. It also has a significant environmental impact as well. But going back to, I think, the question Larry's asked uh, is uh, with Biden, he's going to... Be, He's going to be criticizing both sides. I think in analysis, uh, uh, post-election analysis, he will have done as much to advance the alternative energy as anyone, but not nearly as far as what the progressives want him to do. Uh, he's, uh, uh, so he's angered the progressives not going far enough. He's angered the more conservative by going too far. It is a delicate balance. I think he's going to get credit in the future for uh, for for doing both uh, for advancing the uh, the alternative energies, but has not fatally crippling the uh, our current energy sources, which people have accused him of doing. But he's not coming anywhere close to crippling it. Mr. Carl, well, uh, I think it's interesting because clearly Biden and the administration, their spokespersons, are manipulating. Uh, Dis, you know, dishonestly, the economic trend and the transition from Trump to Biden. I mean, uh, to say say that Biden has made America, you know, successful and a great economy is is, is absurd, and it, and it's it's just a playing game. But the, it's interesting that, and I I didn't realize this fact, you know, that that the oil production's up in the U.S., but. It's clear why we haven't heard that from the Biden administration. Uh, is one of the things that maybe legitimately, one of the few things legitimately he he can brag about because he certainly has said everything you can say to deter oil production in America, and and he promised to do that, and that, that it's despite his you know signals to the environmental psychos, uh, it's, it's still still going up to a lot about the free enterprise system and nothing about Joe Biden's leadership. Here's, here's my problem with uh, oil right now, and it's hard for me to believe that we're leading the world in production right now. It's a fact. I actually remember we actually ran a story on that in the morning show uh, a week ago or so. Uh, we have taken the world's lead in production of oil. Price of oil per barrel right now is above eighty dollars, and it's been going up over the last two months. So gasoline prices, there was like a day when we all got two ninety nine gas here, and it was like two fifty seven in Hampshire County. But Martinsburg, you know, it costs a lot more to get gas to Martinsburg apparently. Uh, but it's eighty dollars a barrel. Interstates. We're, we're like at three and a half bucks a gallon now. So how, how are we producing all this oil yet the oil prices keep going up? How is that even possible? It's, if it's supposed to be a free market, supply and demand, how in the hell are gasoline prices still so high? It's supposed to be a free market. It isn't one. Apparently not. I mean, look, when uh, obviously the local retailers have only a certain number of wholesalers who will bring gas to their store uh, uh, to sell and you know they all have ads about how their gas is better or the other 
but the fact is they get most of them get it all from the same wholesalers and it's roughly the same price maybe you'll get a break if you buy a really big bunch of it but it's roughly the same price um and then they put it in the tank and when the new oil be, or new gas begins to hit the pumps uh you know they can calculate that as they go tracking what's in their in their tanks when the new gas begins to hit the pumps or maybe before that they jack the price up to whatever it needs to be to keep their same margin uh percentage margin of profit as the time before that's why when you drive around town every single gas station is the same price with a very few exceptions um you can find it you know there's some people who watch out for it and they get a couple pennies off um and there are a couple of places there was one in hedgesville where you can get 15 cents off a lot of times um but for the most part the prices are fixed at some other level than the local <laughs> the local retailer making the decision and the, you know they're they're told what to charge so I, I just don't think i haven't thought that gasoline was a free market for since way back in the 80s it just isn't very free and i wish the federal trade commission like they're doing by the way in the grocery business with kroger's and albertson's combined trying to combine they sued them and they said wait a minute you're not going to take over a quarter of the U.S. food market and then start setting the prices for everybody else. We're not going to let you do it. Hey, we have to get to the final issue of the day with that, Michael Carl. Oh, I wanted to comment well, on go, that. Do what you want. It's your time. Okay. Uh, if if there's not competition at the retail level in, in gasoline sales, why do they put such big numbers showing their prices? But I'll go on to something else. It's your it's your clock, sir. Use it as you will. Okay, I'll be real quick. Um, the public policy concerns about TikTok and AI are legitimate. Be for for I'm suggesting that they are, and my my concern is that that unlike every other thing that where you receive information and you give information. This 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 is so uh, uh, separated from credibility and 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 confirmability that that's why I think those concerns are legitimate and and that and that's why I think uh, the proposal to to ban it if they don't sell it and because we cannot be subject to that kind of power and influence over the minds of of our people particularly our young people, that's controlled by the Chinese communists. So ban TikTok. Uh, or make, make them sell it. And, make and them sell it. And so make it so it's independent, yes. All right, Joe Ferretti, got a minute. Well, well uh, I hope that uh, former President Trump's listening, Mike, because uh, he recently came out against the uh, notion of Congress banning TikTok. I agree with you, Mike. Uh, I, I don't like the fact that the Chinese government, which owns basically ByteDance, which owns TikTok, uh, is able to mine our data and, uh, and, and also put out information that could be uh, less than informative uh, for the American citizens. And TikTok is such a, a, a popular social media site. I, I have to believe that the, the danger is real, and I, I think the congressional action is warranted. Uh, the other issue you raise about AI, all you have to know is that the developers of AI testified before Congress about six months ago about the dangers, begging Congress to regulate it. They haven't done anything yet. I hope they get on that, too. Mike Height? Yeah, I'd have to agree. I would, I would ban TikTok uh, regardless of what Trump says. Um, as long as it is uh, affiliated with the, the communist government of China. Um, we don't need it here in the United States. Um, and as far as AI, AI is going to be a problem, and we better get a hold of it now. Um, I know that uh, the West Virginia legislature um, created a new committee just this year um, to uh, take on the, the issues of AI and, and study that and um, try to come up with legislation to to help curb um, the the progress of AI, and it, it could get out of hand really quick. So um, I'm hoping that uh, 
I don't know that you can ban it, but there, it needs to be regulated heavily. Admiral. Yeah, TikTok is static. It's fairly easy to uh, manage, control. I agree that it should probably be disbanded. AI is a different kettle of fish altogether. It's an emerging technology. It's changing so fast. It's going to be awful difficult to understand it well enough to put regulations in place. But we've got to do something. It has it presents not only a phenomenal advantage uh, uh, to the country. There are tremendous risk involved as well. Lawrence, yes, um, AI in particular is going to be hard to control. TikTok, that seems like a no-brainer to me to get that out of the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. But AI, the one of the problems uh, is when I was a kid growing up, if you saw a, a, a video that said live, and there was a guy talking on TV, you knew he said those words. Yeah. That's just not true anymore. (laughs) And that's kind of scary. (laughs) Because it could be anything. It could be anything. We've all seen Terminator and iRobot. How come we're not listening? (laughs) I mean... I, I robot is but You can see that happening. Yeah, but Mike, there are so many advantages to AI. And there are risks involved as well. At this point in time, trying to differentiate differentiate between the two is more than a trivial intellectual process. It is very, very difficult. I agree. Back to you, Michael. Carl. Well, let me say, if, 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 if I thought Donald Trump didn't understand the, 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 the risk of AI particularly, or even TikTok, uh, I would vote against him. <laughs> you know, the Chinese government puts. No, go ahead. Don't, against, don't, don't. against Biden? No, Trump. <laughs> Trump yes. I know, I know. But would you vote against you. Trump for uh, in favor of Biden? I, I, I hope for a third party candidate. <laughs> I'd say vote no and for U.S. president. But but Trump will never ever do the wrong thing on this issue. I'm convinced and crazy statements he makes just to push back or be different uh i write that off completely so you choose to believe the facts you choose to believe is what you're saying i I choose to believe what i know (laughs) and 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 what i have always felt about donald trump based on observing his uh, conduct as president of the united states hey we've got final thoughts coming up eight seconds apiece get them ready larry snoring we're back after this (laughs) 